and wine tasting, which is compliments of Brown Foreman Canada. And welcome to the first event of the Young Women of Influence Fall Session. I'm just going to let you know a little bit about the format tonight, how everything's going to kind of shake down. It's going to start with a presentation by Zara El Harazi, who's co-founder and creative director for Foundry Communications. And I have the opportunity to speak with Zara a little bit already this evening, and let me tell you, you're in for a treat with her presentation. Now after that presentation, there's going to be about a 15 minute question and answer session. And then we're going to move on to a connecting activity, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's designed to help you build relationships and meet some of the amazing women that are in this room tonight. And then lastly, we're going to be giving out some amazing door prizes from our sponsors. And I'm going to take a minute right now just to kind of go over those sponsors who have made this evening possible by their continued support in this initiative and for their presence here tonight. Our title sponsor, Scotiabank, Queen's School of Business, Shoppers Drug Mart, Jones New York, The National Post, Brown Foreman Canada, Chatelaine. And some of these sponsors have uh, supplied these amazing door prizes and I'm gonna let you know what those door prizes are. Scotiabank has supplied a $100 gift certificate to Lululemon, Queen's School of Business, a stylish bag filled with business accessories, the National Post has supplied a swag bag, and Jones New York, a Jones New York iconic white shirt, and we have three of those, so there'll be three winners from for Jones New York. And Shoppers Drug Mart has supplied a Cover Effects gift basket, which includes four amazing products valued at $175. Now, if you didn't get a chance to put your business card in one of the bowls or fill up the ballots in your portfolio, a Woman of Influence representative will be around to collect those for you, so no need to panic. And now I would like to invite Irina Strapnik, Director of the Calgary Centralized Accounting Unit for Scotiabank to the stage, and she's going to introduce our wonderful speaker for this evening. Irina. Good evening. Oh, I'm not quite that tall. <laughs> uh, my name is Irina Strapnik, and I am currently the Director of Scotiabank Centralized Accounting Unit here in Calgary. Um, with over 16 years in the banking industry, I've worked in a variety of operational roles which have taught me about the workings of such a large and dynamic company. Um, understanding the importance of excellent customer service and being an effective people leader are critical in the roles that I play every day. It is my pleasure to welcome you here, this, welcome you here tonight as we kickstart the fall lineup for the Young Women of Influence Evening Series. Scotiabank is proud to be a part of this event and has a long-standing tradition of supporting the advancement of women. Given the positive impact of gender diversity in business, this has been one of our key strategic priorities since 2003. We recognize that bringing together individuals of various backgrounds, skills, and experiences results in more innovative ideas and more out-of-the-box solutions to various business challenges we face every day. A diverse work team leads to better decision making, which in turn leads to better business results. Because of this, we value our partnership with the Women of Influence. This evening series is a means through which we deliver against our objective, which is to provide access to career development opportunities to our next generation of female leaders. Tonight, I am fortunate to have the opportunity to introduce our featured guest, Zara Al-Harazi. Zara grew up in Yemen and until 1996 taught ESL at the Yemen American Language Institute. She immigrated to Canada with her family 15 years ago, but her degree was not recognized in this country. Undaunted, she went back to school and earned a second degree in visual communication from the Alberta College of Art and Design, graduating with accolades and three proud kids at her side. Since then, Zara's career has been anything but mundane. She has won awards for corporate clients such as Nexon Incorporated and ATB Investment Services, has been head of design at powerhouse agency Trigger Communications, and is currently the creative director and two-thirds owner of Foundry Communications. Foundry is at Rodeos and Oil Week's 2011 Best of Show winner and is recognized as one of Canada's top 10 up-and-coming entrepreneurial companies in Profit W100 magazine. Foundry has achieved international acclaim from Hermes International Awards, How International, 
ARC International, LACP International Awards, and the Markham Awards, just to name a few. Um, outside of, of her role as creative director, Zara keeps herself grounded through pro bono work for Immigrant Services Calgary and Design-a-thon, which is a 20, which is an annual 24-hour race to create as much pro bono work as possible for a number of charities. And speaking with Zara um, earlier, that they're actually just preparing for this year's event uh, later in October. Zara also sits on the board of directors for Entrepreneurs Organization and is a former member of the board of directors for Immigrant Services Calgary, at Rodeo Association, and Alberta Women Entrepreneurs. Please help me give a warm welcome to Zara Al-Harazi. is just that it's, it's my story and it's my day-to-day -day life and uh, I struggled with how to tell it um, in a way to keep you interested for 30 minutes and so I I thought I would tell the story of finding my voice and where I started and, and where I came to I do have to apologize though I am currently in the process of losing my voice so <laughs> I'm sorry um, I, I grew up in a culture where my voice really wasn't um, wasn't heard and it wasn't um, it was a time and a, and a place where your voice was, as a woman, wasn't really, um, uh, you didn't really have one. And, and now I've learned to use it and I've learned when to use it and I've learned what I want to say. But in between then and now, there is a million and one stories and I'd like to share some of them with you today. So I'm going to start at the very beginning and I'll be quick. But, um, I was born in Uganda, in Kampala, and my family um, Idi Amin at the time gave every brown person in the country three days to leave um, with a little more than the clothes on their back and he wanted to take Africa back for the Africans and uh, um, so my, my family left um, my, 11, my dad took his 11 brothers and sisters and his uh, parents and me and my mom and uh, we, we moved back to Yemen and he always tells me this story about how they moved and, and um, he had seven dollars that he hid in his shoes as they left, and that was all they had when they went back to Yemen. And I think about that, those seven dollars a lot. My dad has amazing stories, but you know, the seven dollars kind of sticks with me, except when Holtz is having a sale. <laughs> um, um, so I grew up in Yemen, an only child to a Yemeni father and an Indian mother. Um, I had amazing parents that, that moved the earth to make a good life for everybody, and my uncles and aunts and, and myself, and. Um, they, uh, they came with nothing and we lived in two rooms and they grew it to, to something amazing and they raised all my uncles and aunts and, uh, and, and they gave them this great life and, and my mother worked for the United Nations and my dad worked for the, um, uh, for the government and I still remember my seventh birthday, my birthday is on United Nations Day and uh, I had a few thousand people sing happy birthday to me because they had the United Nations party so that was exciting as a kid. Um, we traveled the world as a kid. We, we, we had gondola rides in, in Switzerland and safaris in Kenya and um, horseback rides up mountains in, in Kashmir. And I was really stubborn and Kashmir kind of sticks in my head because uh, my mom told me to not swim in the lake. And as soon as her back was turned, the houseboy and I, because we were staying on a houseboat, went swimming in the lake. And I contracted every single parasite known to man. And I spent three weeks in the hospital. So listen to your mother. Um, so growing up, I lived as Western of a life as I could as a Yemeni girl. I uh, went to the international school. My mom pulled every string she could to get me into that school. It was mostly a school for the expatriate community, so it was the children of all the ambassadors and, um, and, and all the expat community, and there was a handful of Yemeni students in the school, and uh, I was the one scholarship student. And, uh, but. I, I saw how the Western world lived, but I couldn't participate. It was them and us, and this was how it was in Yemen. And, and I was different than, um, than my classmates. And, um, and then my dad yanked the rug, the rug out from under me, and he decided that I was too Western, and he didn't like how I was acting, and um, that I needed to remember where I'm from. And so I got put into an older Yemeni school. I was 11. And I didn't speak Arabic. I didn't read or write it. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know anybody in the school. 
I had an Indian mother. I wore mini skirts. All those things worked, worked against me. And, and for almost two years, uh, girls who are my best friends today did not want to talk to me. I was the stuck up, almost Yemeni girl, and uh, they weren't my friends. And, and I wasn't stuck up. I just, I didn't know how to communicate with them. I didn't speak Arabic. And, um, and I was very unique at the time, but it didn't matter to me because I spent junior high and high school trying to fit in. I tried to hide that voice and I tried to hide what made me different because I wanted to be like everybody else and I wanted to be accepted. And so I started wearing a hijab with my mini skirts, which <laughs> do not <know>, right? <laughs> not quite right. right. Um, took me a while to figure out um, who that person is, but I did. And uh, I, I, I created this box and, and this person that I decided that I needed to be in order to fit in. And I did. I made, I, I, I fit into that box and I made friends and, um, and it was great. Um, Oscar Wilde had this saying that says, my, my great mistake, the fault for which I can't forgive myself, is that one day I seized my obstinate pursuit for my own individuality. And I think for, for teenage girls, um, it's, teenage girls have it really tough because I didn't realize it at the time, but I created this persona that I needed to be, to fit in um, with everybody else. And uh, I didn't want anything to do with how different I was. And it took me years to shed that, and uh, you close your mind to uh, to everything else, and you become this person that you think you need to be, and you think everybody else expects you to be, but they don't really. It's what the expectation, the worst expectations that are set are the ones that you set onto yourself. So, um, I got married when I was 17. That was pretty normal in Yemen. You got married when you were 17, and um, uh, I look at my girls now, and they're. My daughters are 19 and 20, and they are children. And you know, there's just there's the different uh, difference. I don't know if we were more responsible then, or circumstances make you into a, a certain person that you need to be, and you just become responsible and and, and you live that life. But uh, yeah, I don't think my daughters are mature enough to get married or have kids or, or move to a whole new country. Uh, um, so grade 12, spring break. I'm flying to London to buy my wedding trousseau. And I still remember walking the third floor in Harrods in my poofy sleeve beaded, this is 1988, and uh, that dress will never see the light of day. <laughs> uh, purple eyeshadow and this. And, and if you take one thing away from this talk today, for those of you who are not married yet, think about how your wedding photos are gonna look 10 years from now. <laughs> and keep it simple. Again, I didn't listen to my mom who told me to keep it simple. Um, so we had about 2,000 guests at our wedding. It was uh, pretty typical. We had a big wedding and uh, it was days long and there was lunches and dinners and uh, lots and lots and lots of wedding gifts um, amongst which uh, we had 4,000 goats. Now, <laughs> I don't really know if we had 4,000 goats. The, the number keeps going up sometimes with the storytelling over the years. But we had a lot of goats, and uh, before anybody asked me what we did with our goats, we ate them. We had 2,000 wedding guests for a week. So, um, <laughs> after, after the wedding was done, I, uh, I kind of realized that, oh my God, I'm married. The party is over, and I've done my shopping in London, and uh, I've had my party, and, and I'm married, and I'm 17. And uh, it was exciting for a while, we moved to the US, and, uh, which was a whole new world for me. And um, so backtrack for a minute, when we were in Yemen, my parents uh, eventually got to a point where we had a really great life and we had a comfortable life. So I came from having a maid and a cook and a, and a driver to uh, flying to the States and having to do everything by myself. And uh, about a year after um, I was married, I remember Nader saying to me, because um, I made chicken curry every single day. And he said, I thought your mom said you cooked every Friday. And I said, yeah, I made chicken curry. <laughs> <laughs> so, needless to say, I learned to be domestic in a big curry. <clears throat> so we're all in Missouri, smack dab in the middle of, of uh, redneck America. 13,000 people and 8,000 of those were the students at the university. And um, for the first time, my voice became rebellious. 
and I wanted to do everything that I couldn't do before. And so I wore short shorts and belly shirts, and I smoked, and I went to rock concerts, and I, um, you name it, I wanted to do it, and I was 18 years old. Um, I enrolled in computer science at the university. My dad thought that was the best career for me, and, and, and so, so did I. Um, I was a different person back then. I didn't have a ton of ambition, and I, I didn't realize it at the time. Um, so I very quickly came to realize that computer programming and, and me do not get along, and I wasn't very good at it. And in year two at university, I got pregnant. I, I had a man in this incredible, beautiful, um, stunning little girl that was mine, and uh, who also had colic and cried for hours every day. And I was 19 years old. Um, so I quit school, and we moved to Dallas, Texas. Also redneck, middle America, kind of, but, but on a much bigger scale. Um, I, I got pregnant again, and I had this little one that I didn't know how to take care of, really. And I had a really tough, medically challenged uh, pregnancy. And it was so bloody hot all the time. And the only thing I wanted to do with my voice at that point was scream and frustration. Um, Dallas doesn't have good memories for me. And one of them was um, Piggly Wiggly. That's the local grocery store. And uh, in Dallas, I looked Mexican, and I, I was treated like I was Mexican. And, and it's quite different there than it is in Canada. And grocery shopping was quite different than you went to the grocery store and, and you wrote a check. Um, we didn't have debit cards. And then you gave them your driver's license, and they wrote your driver's license number at the back of your, your check. And I hated handing over my driver's license every single time because I knew the look that was going to come. Because I had a belly out to here, and I had this kid on one hip, and my driver's license had a big red minor stamped across it. Because I wasn't 21 yet. <laughs> so, it was interesting times. So, Dallas is gone from my mind. Um, but life was very different back then for me. I really didn't have much ambition. Um, I loved my kids. I absolutely worshipped the ground they walk on. And um, I was busy struggling with trying to be a mom. I was yet again in a, in a different country, in a different town, and I didn't know anybody. And I was, I was trying to be a good mother, and I was trying to fit in with Western culture, and I was trying to remember um, who I was. And I forgot that I was a teenager. And I became the mother that um, I was at the time. And if I think back now, if I would do it any differently, I really don't think I would. I, I think that I did it. It happened in a way that suited me. Um, I I don't have enough patience now to raise kids, so I'm glad I had them when I was young and I didn't know any better. Um, it, it was very organic. I don't remember actually raising them. It just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Um, and the career came after, and that was okay. It, it kind of worked out for me. Um, so I had another, in Dallas, I had another amazing, beautiful, incredible daughter. And uh, this one slept all the time. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> I realized then, though, that I really needed my mother. I had two little kids. I was 21. I had no idea how to do this, and I wanted to go home. And I, I, I left um, him behind, and I went back to Yemen for, I think, almost a year by myself, and I lived with, with my mom. And I don't remember those months of my children's life because I kind of dumped and ran. Um, my mother and my grandmother raised the girls for me, and I was busy having fun with my friends. And uh, unfortunately, I missed the growing up that my girls did in those few months, but I realize now that I was doing some growing up of my own. And so it was, it was what needed to happen. And uh, they were awesome. They took care of the girls, and I didn't have to do a thing. Um, so we lived in Yemen for three years, and, and a lot happened in those three years. Uh, the first thing that happened was civil war. So my house, Sana'a doesn't have a lot of paved roads. And across my house has this giant paved road in front of it. And across the street from my house is the president's house. And so I always assumed that the paved road was because the president's house was right there. And uh, we knew that something was going to happen. There was unrest, and there we had a democratic, um, uh, no, we had a democratic north and a communist south, and there was there was some problems that were coming. And so we decided to take an extended vacation in, in Cairo for a few months. And we booked tickets to leave uh, to leave on on Saturday morning. 
Um, Friday night at about four in the morning, about 50 tanks start rolling outside my door. And then warplanes start taking off. And uh, that big paved road in front of my house was an emergency runway. So it was an interesting few days. Um, <clears throat> We were at war and the airports were shut down and we couldn't leave. I could leave if I wanted to because both my daughters were American, um, but none of my family could. And uh, the American embassy was willing to evacuate only me and the girls. And so I decided to stay. And we moved out of my house and into my parents' house because the war basically moved out of the city. But there was these scud missiles that kept coming every night and they were old and inaccurate, and even though the president's house was a target and we had moved into my parents' house, it didn't really matter because they fell anywhere in the city. And you woke up in the morning, you heard them go off at night, and you woke up in the morning and you checked to see who got hit the night before. And it wasn't that long, it was three weeks, and I know it sounds like I was in the middle of a war, but really, at the time, it, it, it really didn't feel like it. It was another day. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, maybe I just blocked it out, but I don't remember. Um, being terribly anxious. Um, so, the other thing that happened when uh, we were in Yemen is I, uh, I, I finished up my credentials and I started teaching. And first I taught at the uh, Pakistani school and I taught grade two. And I had 106 students in my classroom in a classroom that only seated about 70. And I was the music teacher, and I do not play a single instrument. I do not want to hear me sing. Um, I was the gym teacher, and I grew up wearing a veil. I've never played a sport in my life. So I was everything, and I there's no way I could reach all these kids. And I did that for a year, and I quit. And it's one of the few things in my life that I regret, because I quit. I just didn't want to do it anymore. And um, it, 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 it's sad, but that's kind of the situation. Um, and that's the situation they're in. And if people like me quit, then they really don't have a lot of hope. Um, then I taught English at the Yemen American Language Institute. And that was another interesting experience because I taught adult males mostly. Males and females, but there were a lot of uh, males from the Ministry of Oil. And uh, a lot of them would walk into the classroom and see me and leave. And I was a young woman and I had nothing to teach them. And at the time, the director of the institute was this wonderful man, uh, John Kincannon. And he, uh, he'd say to them, sit in her class for a couple of days, just try it out. You might like it, you might not. If you want to move, I'll get you another teacher. And I think in, in, in the time that I taught there, I lost one student, and the rest of them stayed. But I learned how to use my voice differently. I learned how to use my voice to advocate change. Because I had these classrooms where the boys sat here and the girls sat here, and they never talked to each other. Um, it was it was it was the way it was those days. Especially, I still remember um, in uh, I think it was in grade ten, and one of my friend's brothers came to the the, the school gates and uh, said hello to me, and I said hello back, and and I left. And the next day, I got called into the principal's office, and my dad got called because I talked to a boy outside the school. So it was just the way it was, but not in my class. In my class, they had to sit together. They sat where I told them to sit. And they worked in teams. And by the end of every semester, the guys and girls were friends. And that was really exciting. Um, the third thing that happened in Yemen was I had another baby. And I had my son. And he's this amazing kid who, who acts like he's 28, and he's only 15 now. And. Um, some of you in the audience have heard the story of me giving birth in Yemen, and that is a whole other talk by itself. <laughs> um, but I had this precious little boy. And so I raised my kids, and I followed routine, and I did what was expected of me. And it, it really, some of those expectations were expectations that I set upon myself. Um, they were mine. And I had it pretty easy. My kids are amazing. They are star athletes and they're star students and they're respectful and they're fun and they're, they're, they're great kids. And a lot of times I feel like this bystander who just stands and watches them excel and, and I'm just so incredibly proud. But I was at war with myself. I, I, I needed and wanted something else. I just didn't know what. Like I still wasn't thinking business and, and, and you know something that's my own. And um, I just, Something was missing and I didn't have a clue what. And I guess it, over the decades, um, I found a special talent for not saying them. And whether it was the Yemeni student in the international school or the not quite Yemeni student in the Arabic school or 
um, the uh, sheltered Muslim girl drawing male nudes at ACAD. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was always something or, or the other. It's been very inconvenient, but very life-altering. Um, being conspicuous makes it harder to fall through the cracks. I didn't realize that for a really long time. Um, it's liberating being the odd one out. I know that now because I can say stupid things and people excuse it. <laughs> stick my foot in my mouth like I do on a daily basis and it's okay. Um, it took me years and years to actually appreciate standing out and being different because all I wanted to do was be like everybody else. And truthfully, it wasn't until we moved to Canada that I realized that. Um, in Canada, regardless of color or culture, regardless of family or background, if you're willing to, her to work hard and you're willing to put the time and effort into it, you can do anything. And anywhere else that I've lived, if you're different, you know it. In Canada, if you're different, you celebrate it. And that was something that was so eye-opening for me. Um, it was shocking to find out that what made me different was what made me interesting. And uh, I learned to, uh, to be proud of that. So as it turns out, um, the big motivating force in my life that made me you know, um, turn to, uh, to a life that, uh, and a career, it wasn't an epiphany or a higher power or um, a, a strong mentor or anything that drastic. It was sheer boredom. So <laughs> we were living in Abbeydale, um, northeast Calgary and the kids had started school, and winter was this huge shock of reality. <laughs> it snowed out there, I didn't want to go out of the house, and I, I just, it was so quiet, and I learned to, to monitor when the furnace turned on and turned off and knew the timing. I was bored out of my skull, and I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any credentials that were accepted here. And so I went to the mall, and I got a job at Danny Leather, and, <laughs> and I had my, first inkling of marketing and communication because we had a book of rules of how you should treat a customer and what you say to them and, and the questions that you ask them and you know it was a question where they couldn't answer you in a yes or no because you have to engage them in conversation and I threw that away and um, I, I started to realize how to deal with people, who to approach, when to approach them, what to say to them, who to compliment, who to leave alone like me when I'm shopping, leave me alone. Um, people are different and you start to realize what triggers them and what motivates them and I realized that I was kind of good at it and I was hooked on marketing for the first time. So I decided um, that I wanted to go back to school. I didn't want to go back to teaching. Um, I knew how to draw and so I thought I'd go to ACAD, I'll go to ACAD, I'll go to drawing school and when I was there I decided to be a graphic designer. I don't think I fully realized what it was to be a graphic designer but I knew how to draw. And so I uh, I enrolled at ACAD. Um, I was told by Eugene, the head of the design uh, department at the time, that I would never make it. BC was a really tough program. A child that I was the legal guardian of, who was 20 days older than my daughter. And uh, didn't think I would make it. There was all these young 18-year-olds that were full of life and talent, and, and then there was me. And yet, he let me into the department. I, I still don't know why, because he let in 40 students out of 200, and I was one of them and I was 28 years old, and I had three kids, four kids. And it was a tough program. There was a lot of, of hands-on work, and I had four kids, and um, I had a lot of help at home. And one of the first things I realized being in school that I really didn't know how to draw. Um, my skills were so basic compared to everybody else. And uh, there was a lot of all-nighters. And thank you, Louise, for endless cups of tea and cookies at 4 in the morning. So um, the biggest lesson I learned was I didn't know how to draw. And that was kind of interesting for me because that was the reason I went into ACAD. Um, at one of my crits, one of my instructors, Tim Noakes, we had put all our work up. And uh, he walked by, and, and as he walked by my piece of art, he sneezed. And he said, excuse me, I'm really allergic to bad art. <laughs> and um, I realized that I was never going to be an illustrator. And uh, I just, I wasn't going to be an illustrator, but I was really good at design. And so I focused on design. And I told all my illustration teachers that they were getting shafted. I'm sorry, that's just how it's going to be. I only had so much time to work. 
And um, so I discovered passion. And not at first. At first, I really sucked. Um, by fourth year, I was really good at graphic design. And my instructors were wondering, what the hell happened? And who the hell are you? And uh, I graduated. Um, I, uh, I was the first in my graduating class to get a job. I have been invited to ACAD to teach a third year class um, uh, in January. I haven't told you that, Allison, yet. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, teach a third year class on branding, which is exciting to me because initially I was told that I wouldn't make it. Um, I was 32 years old. I had just finished university and I was looking for a job and I, I got a job with one of my instructors and it was a really small agency. I was their only employee and I did that for a year. And then I went to a really large agency and I was winning international design awards from the time I graduated. And at the big agency, I started as a junior designer and within a year and a half I was running the design department. And um, I did that for a year and a half. Um, and I realized that uh, I was always fighting to do things in a certain way. My bosses didn't know how to do it, I knew. And I couldn't do it my way when I was working for them. And um, I had blinders on and I could only see ideals and, and it was my way or the highway. And uh, Allison invited me to uh, join her and start a new company. And uh, she had just uh, had a, a, a challenge, a personal challenge, and I jumped at the chance. And on a side note, Allison is celebrating her fifth anniversary of being cancer-free. Congratulations. So we went from three people to 15 in five years. We won countless design awards. We were doing amazing work. Uh, we made the, the, the Profit 100 list, the W100 list, twice. Um, first in our fourth year as one of the 10 companies to watch. And today we found out that we made the W100 list as one of the top 100 profitable companies in Canada, and we're number 82 on the list. And hey, <laughs> we won a one-show pencil, which is the mother of all award shows, and uh, it was only the third one to come to Calgary, and we were so excited. Um, we just Ursula's wedding invitation just won a platinum in the Creativity International Awards, and. So we've been raking in these awards, and it's because we do good work. Um, we amassed this fantastic client list that we are so proud of, and some of them are in the audience today. Thank you. Um, these are clients that let us shine, and they let us be creative, and they have become our friends, and thank you very much. Um, we hired an amazing, stupidly talented team. Um, my, my staff, our staff are like my kids, and they are smart, smarter than us and they are talented and they are fun and we love going to work. Um, but early on at Foundry, I found that uh, I, I, <coughs> I might have misused my newfound voice and uh, I knew exactly what I wanted and I knew exactly how I wanted it done and nobody was going to tell me otherwise. And I, um, I think Allison told me I was like a herd of elephants. Um, that, um, so I walk away from meetings having stated my opinion and fully expecting everybody to do it my way. And I learned um, quickly that in finding your voice, you have to learn when not to use it and when to listen to others. And you have so much to learn from others. Um, I try hard to listen carefully now, and I sometimes fail. But when I do, my team are very quick to tell me to not use my voice. So in closing, um, what have I learned? Um, I learned to constantly change my expectations. We set guidelines and expectations for ourselves and we get disappointed if we don't meet them. And you're not always gonna meet them, change them. If something isn't working, find something else, find something that works, redefine success. There's always something. Um, a clean house and done laundry to me is just as rewarding as a big business win. And I have more big business wins than I have a clean house. Um, uh, at the very least, there is the experience of getting there. And don't be afraid to make mistakes. You will. You will make a lot of mistakes. Um, like I said, I stick my foot in my mouth at least once a day. I'm okay with that. You will only find and learn from change when you're brave enough to look stupid. 
And it's okay if you ask the dumb questions. They're what make you smarter. Um, a friend once told me that I don't have an edit button. And I'm okay with that. I'm okay with not having an edit button because if I shelter everything I say, I might miss something exciting. We are in the creative business. And you have to be creative. And there are no bad ideas. I learned that standing out is a blessing, not a curse. Um, search it out, celebrate it. It's what makes you different and it's what makes you interesting. I learned that you need to be excited and you need to love what you do. And if you do, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, our job is, is so much fun. It's, it, each project is like birthing a child. Um, not literally, but sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. Um, and it's okay. It's, it's really exciting. Get excited by what you do. And if you're not excited by what you do, find something that does excite you. Um, finally, forget about doing it all. You're not going to do it all. Um, business success comes at a cost. And could I have, should I have cooked more? Could I have gone to more volleyball, hockey, basketball games? Um, yeah, I will always regret that. Um, but the hardest expectations that we set on ourselves are our own. And um, I've come to terms with my lack of superhero ability. And I've learned to accept it. And you know, my kids have learned that I'm not going to be there for every single game, but I'm going to be to as I'm going to be there for as many as I can. Um, so through four decades, two civil wars, four children, two cross-continental moves relocations, endless cultural clashes, bumps in the road, wonder, diversity, excitement, challenge, classrooms and boardrooms, airport lines, um, and many amazing people that I have met over the course of my life, I have found my voice. Um, for me, it comes down to choosing confidence over fear and choosing uh, positivity over, neg over being negative. And happiness, I believe, is a choice that we all make. Um, you decide whether you want to be happy and you decide whether you want to be thankful. And my grandmother used to slap me upside my head anytime I complained. And she would tell me that I needed to be thankful for everything I had because I had my vision and I had my legs and I had my friends and my family and I had food on the table and I always had something to be thankful for. And I think if, if you grow up believing in that, you find pleasure in the little things. You learn that your glass is always full and you look at things differently, and your voice will always be confident and clear. Thank you very much.